Welcome to Real Estate Coaching Radio, starring award-winning real estate coaches and number one international best-selling authors, Tim and Julie Harris. This is the number one daily radio show for realtors looking for a no BS, authentic, real-time coaching experience. What's really working in today's market, how to generate more leads, make more money, and have more time for what you love in your life. And now your hosts, Tim and Julie Harris. We are back and today we're going to be, well, today and tomorrow, we're going to yes. be, we're going to be answering the ever so omnipresent and incredibly annoying question <laughs> yeah. that you're getting on a regular basis. If you're, you know, being active in real estate is you're getting this from sellers. I would sell my home, but I have no place to move to ever heard that one before agents <laughs> every day, all every, day. Exactly. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be walking you through 10 ways to handle that objection in great detail. And remember, like always our notes, and there are a lot of notes that Mrs. Harris has created for you guys today and tomorrow are in the show description below. We can't fit all of the notes in the show description because we're limited by iTunes, but the reality of it is there's a lot of great content down there for you. And also you will find the link to join Premier Coaching. So if you love this podcast, which tens of thousands of you listen every day, so a lot of you love this podcast, then you will be absolutely blown away by the quality of the coaching in Premier Coaching. So you can join Premier Coaching right now for free. Just scroll down in the show description, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, does not matter how you're listening to us. Just scroll down and join Premier Coaching right now. It is free. There's absolutely no risk and there's absolutely no reason for you not to join Premier Coaching. And yes, it does include a daily semi-private coaching call. So Julie, let's roll in. That's right. So with record low inventory nationwide, you guys listening, realtors, brokers, you seem to be hearing that same thing every day, day in and day out. I'd move, but where would I go? For most agents, that's the end of the conversation, simultaneously ending the possibility of taking a new listing as well as facilitating that buyer side. After all, nationwide inventory is at all time lows. According to Altos Research this week, it's about a half million active listings. For comparison, we should be at about a million and a half. So yeah. we're still at least a million shy of being in a balanced market. Worth mentioning, does not include new construction. It's only stuff in the MLS. We're going to talk about that too. All right. So don't just answer with, this should sound like some of you, you've got to stop this. Yep. There's really nothing on the market. I mean, everything in the MLS is already pending. I'll put you into my search widget and we'll watch for something to pop up together. Otherwise known as your drip system. Gross. Okay. While that's one method of finding something for your would-be sellers to buy, you can't end the conversation there and expect to do any business this year or probably next year. So we're going to talk about 10 solutions that go beyond waiting and dripping on and watching for magic inventory to arise, which then would shake loose that listing for you as well. We're going to do five points today and five points tomorrow that will handle the objection. Really, that's what it is. An objection is the question in the mind of the seller slash buyer in this case. I'd sell, but where would I move to? So here are five solutions today and five solutions tomorrow. Now you can use these, by the way, Julie, have you yeah. used this content for one of the articles you write for National Association or Florida Association? I or? think it's in Housing Wire, actually. Oh, okay. So this is, you know, this is killer content. It's a good article. Yeah, yeah you I should probably should send it to NAR. You should send this to NAR and good to point. FAR and, and to TAR. And, and, <laughs> all of them, all of y'all. And by the way, Premier Coaching members, because I know a lot of you guys listen, my elite coaching clients, you know, this is going to be in detail as a standalone leave behind page for use in listing and buyer presentations. So well, that's okay. for coaching clients. Again, you could parse this content up and yep. you could make this into a bunch of social media videos. Absolutely. You could make this into a bunch of little Instagram posts and whatnot. I mean, so that's good stuff. Idea. All right. So part one, Julie Harris. Okay. I would sell, I would list with you, but where would I go? Okay. Point number one, this is my favorite point. That's why it's number one. Consider building a home instead of chasing after scarce resale inventory. There are several advantages to this option. Okay, so why am I going into detail? So that you can explain why you would want to consider this to your sellers. Several advantages. First, many builders are buying down interest rates using their in-house financing. Builders are closing loans, and I did check on this up to date. Builders are currently closing loans in the 45 to 5.5% interest range currently. That's better. Next, the house is new. No rehab for them, and guess what? No inspection woes for you. You like that, right? No client can get their, your client can get their home on the market a couple of months prior to completion and not have to move twice. Finally, when your client builds, they're not having to compete in a bidding war. Remember that 30% of available homes right now are new construction. Historically, in a more balanced market, 
even in a less hot uh, seller's market, that's usually only about 10%. Right now it's 30% of available homes. If you can't find it in your MLS, which is highly likely, ask your Harris certified coach how to know where the new construction is in your town. We've also done dedicated podcasts all about new construction. So you mentioned interest rates, builders. Here's the thing. I was on a phone call with uh, Keith Moulton. Keith. Heath, yeah. sorry. Mm-hmm. Heath Moulton in Iowa. And Heath and his uh, small team, they do, I mean, this is Inkeny, Iowa, right? They'll they'll sell, I don't want to give any of his numbers away, but let's just say an absolute ton of houses in Iowa. And Hundreds. oceans of them are new construction. Uh, yeah, and oceans of them are new construction. Most of them are new construction. So I'm having a conversation with him and we're talking about like in his market, it's adjust, you know, interest rates are adversely affecting resale and whatever. Mm-hmm. And how the builders absolutely own the marketplace because the builders can buy the interest rates down. But what was fascinating was not only are the um, builders able to lower the interest rates, but in some cases they're actually selling their houses for more than what a resale comparable home would cost. Why? Because buyers are payment shoppers. That is all people really focus on. And that's all they'll ever focus on is what's the payment. Car payments, house payments, all the rest of it. That's the reason that the interest rates are so you know important to the market. So the builders can actually sell a house for more money and have the payment you know, like maybe sell something for four hundred or five hundred in his market, whereas the resale home is going to cost maybe four hundred. Uh, so the house is newer, it's you know maybe even bigger, and the payments lower than a house that costs less. You guys hopefully are understanding how incredibly powerful new construction is in the market. And just so you're also very clear, your resale sellers can also be offering to buy the interest rates down on buyers' homes, thus making your payments lower as well. And obviously making your uh, listing a heck of a lot more seductive in this marketplace. We've done tons of coaching, tons of podcasts on how to do that. Make sure you listen to our past shows. Point number two. Point number two, consider buying first, closing, and then listing the previous home. Don't assume that your buyer slash seller prospects won't or can't utilize this option. They may have a down payment saved that's not part of their home equity. They might be able to use a bridge loan to borrow their equity, close on the next home, and then sell the old one. You don't know if you don't ask. This is something agents get nervous about asking because they themselves sometimes can't imagine doing it. The advantage is that your client can make a non-contingent offer, secure their next home, and deal with their old house later. Make sure you know lenders who offer bridge loans and you understand how to explain this option. Well, what's going to happen in a lot of markets is the buyers who are also have houses to sell are actually going to be able to afford payments on the current home and on the new home because yes. the payment on the current home is so low because the interest rate's so low. So don't be surprised. Julie said it right there. She said it was really quick, right? You know, just because you can't fathom doing that financially, don't assume that your buyers are in the same position as you. They may have just inherited a bunch of money. They may have saved up a bunch of money. They might be in a completely different financial zone than you actually give them credit for. So explain to them that this is the easiest option. Because by the way, listeners, it is. If they can buy a house and then move it you know, from the old house to the new house kind of whenever they want to over a period of time. Less pressure. Less pressure, a lot less stress. And they can do some repairs on the old house or rather on the new house, live in the old house while the, you know, you guys get the concept here. You can even buy here. a rehab and slow play it. You know, there's lots exactly. of options with that. Don't just, per, you know, don't just qualify somebody based on your own standards. Just, you know, present that as an option and don't be sh- uh, shocked when a lot of them say, yeah, let's just go about it that route. And then, well, you know, then run them up the flagpole with the lender. Yes. And this is actually an advantage to the market being the way it is because the house that they're going to sell, you know, they figure it's probably going to sell right away when they do put it on the market. They're not going to have a big lag time of six or eight months to wait. So that, that can be a very good option. Make sure you don't glaze over that. All right. Point number three or option number three, consider selling the house first renting for a while and taking the time to look for the right home. The advantage here is that the seller has cashed out their equity and is ready to pounce on the right home, but without the pressure of organizing closing and possession dates. Who are your go-to leasing agents? It might be you. Consider both traditional rentals, short-term vacation rentals that may consider a lease, as well as apartment complexes. Many of them have great amenities, which could work for a short or longer-term lease while you help your client find the right home to buy. That's the most hassle to the seller, obviously, because they're going to have to move twice. But again, that's their choice. Let them decide. Yeah, they, they may not even be thinking about it if you don't present that. And, you know, not all sellers are families with four kids to organize. Some of them are, you know, single guys that can go to an apartment for well, a while. Well, along those lines, where that works is where you maybe it's a, you know, a, 
a, a, a flat someplace in, you know, LA or New York or, you know, someone doesn't have a lot of stuff or whatever. And maybe they're selling their old place with the furniture kind of thing. And scenarios like that, you got to present that to them because they might be like, well, that's a great idea. I'll just go do that. Or don't be surprised sometimes. I don't know if this is one of your points, but don't be surprised sometimes if some of these folks already have another place to live. That's if, true too. If they kept maybe their, you know, an old house or if they have somebody, you know, that's out of town all the time. You know what I'm hearing a lot is they have a VRBO someplace and they're going to live exactly. in that for a while. <laughs> yeah, same. Or a rental that they've had for a long time. You know, there's options. The point here is you can't stop the conversation by saying, I'll throw you into my drip system and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> well, you can if you don't want to sell real estate. Exactly. That's not working. You guys know this. Okay, point number four, consider getting the seller's home on the market now, but make the acceptance of the offer that you are going to get contingent on seller finding suitable housing. Now, that's a phrase that many of you have never used before because there was more inventory, more movement, and we didn't have to do that. But make it conting the acceptance contingent on seller finding suitable housing. The buyer will probably want a specific time frame. They don't want to wait forever, but you can usually get 90 to 120 days to secure the next home. Many buyers in today's market are just anxious to find the right home and lock it up, and they will be flexible with the seller's situation. It's still a seller's market. The advantage to your client is they won't have to move twice, and you've negotiated for them enough time to look for the next place. Now I have a question for you. Yes. I, I think I have my opinion on this, but I want to know what you think. Would you put the contingent on seller finding suitable housing in the uh, public comments or the agent comments in the MLS? In other words, listeners, what I'm asking is if your buyers are sifting through the MLS and they stumble across, you know, listing that they want to buy, which, you know, is going to be easy. And do you, would you put the, uh, in the comments after you've, you know, given the flowery description of the house contingent upon seller finding suitable housing, or would you put this, that in the, uh, second page where the seller, uh, where the buyer won't see where it's only for agent to agent comments, where, where would you put it, Julie? I would say... Unless the MLS says that I have to put it in there, I might not put it in there at all. I just negotiate that again, you know, when an offer came in, especially if I think I'm going to get multiple offers because they're either going to be okay with it or not. But if the MLS says you have to do that, then I would do it on the second page agent to agent comments. So I would put it on the first page. Why? And because I wouldn't want to deal with the buyers that weren't willing to deal with that. Or you want to pre-whittle them out? I pre-whittle them out. That's, that's what bad, I would do. I, I would tell them ahead of time. This is the house you're going to buy. This is the great. This is exactly what you're looking for. But you're going to have to suck it up, Buttercup, and you're going to have That's to wait true. for. That's true. Kind of pre-negotiating, yeah. In a sense. And well, it also it'll root out, um, you know, buyers' agents that don't know how to deal with their buyers well, not understanding point. what okay. it is. Okay, yeah. I revised my answer. To okay, that then. all right, good. In, in the light of pre-qualifying. Yes. Exactly. Okay. Point number five, or solution number five: consider keeping the old house, turning it into a rental for now, and proceed to find the purchase for the next home. You can handle the lease yourself or refer it to your favorite leasing agent. The home stays an asset for your client and they can keep their low interest rate mortgage. Or maybe it's already paid off. Don't assume that this is not an option. You have to ask. Remember that Americans currently have record high credit scores. They may be comfortable taking this option, more comfortable than you think. In some markets, keeping the home and turning it into a short-term rental, VRBO, for example, can be very profitable. It might actually be the best option for your client. Now, here's, I remember very clearly back in 2000 and 2008 when the wheels were coming off the wagon yep. in the economy, but real estate primarily. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't Jade Mills. It was another one of these huge agents out in California. Mm -hmm. And we had her on the podcast and she was telling us how they were converting Valerie Fitzgerald. Yep. She was converting all of her high end listings of which she had quite a few, like I think 15 or 20 at the time. Mm -hmm. And essentially all the sellers were in very good, you know, cash situations, mm -hmm. but they didn't want to lower their prices. So that's yeah. a little advanced coaching for those of you who are working in the high end market. The reason that you don't see precipitous price drops, even in a tough market in high end markets is because the sellers don't need the money. They have, you know, it's like it's either in the front pocket or the back pocket. They've always got money. House might be paid off. Right. They have, Well, that's one of many. And yeah. you know, that's what Valerie was dealing with. A lot of our clients mm -hmm. are like that. A lot of our personal elite clients are some of these, you know, again, very lead agents in the nation where they do deal with people that are, you know, very wealthy. That's just, mm -hmm. you know. They don't have to sell just because prices are coming down. There's no distress there. Right. So if Valerie would have gone to those sellers and tried to sort of panic, panic get, you know, through telling them the truth about the market, getting them to lower the price, they'd say, nope, we're just going to keep the house. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we created, a, you know, essentially a, a script or a process 
where you give the seller an option. So A is that we retail the house and you know obviously we try to get the best price and terms for you. And B, if it doesn't sell after a certain amount of time or any point any point when you want to, we'll just, you know, put it for lease. And we can actually have it for lease, Mr. Seller, at the t- same time we have for it, have it for sale, and whichever way it goes is the way it goes. Now, why are you doing it that way? Because A, it's going to make you more competitive on a listing presentation. B, it's going to put you in a situation where you're going to um you know, give different options to a prospective buyer. Because the other side of that is you're going to run into buyers that are nervous about purchasing in this marketplace that are financeable, that are qualified to buy, but they're worried about prices dropping. No problem. You can lease the house for six months or for a year, and then we'll close on it then. The point is, is you have the damn listing or you have it as a listing, as you're managing the lease. You have controlled what happens, the outcome of that property, and you'll get paid once it actually does sell or you'll get paid on the lease. The worst thing you can do is walk into a listing presentation and only have like one option. We're going to put it for sale. No other solutions for that prospective seller. Yeah. You won't get the listing. You know, there's the biggest secret of being a listing agent. <laughs> I always make, I I can't say this with a straight face (laughs) because I think it's so dumb and funny at the same time. The biggest secret to being a listing agent, and this is something we normally reserve just for our highest of, you know, elite clients, our elite of the elites. This is the big secret all of you guys have been waiting for. The secret to being a successful listing agent. Ready for it? Ready, listeners? Are you leaning into your mics? (laughs) Don't tell anybody else. Are you turning up the volume? Here it is. Have the listing when it sells. Have the listing when it sells. So if you're in a marketplace right now and you're, you know, you have prospective sellers and, you know, again, if they're mostly higher end types and they're getting frustrated with you for not having sold the house yet because the market's just not there right now, maybe for their particular product, you need to suggest to them right away that they lease the property. And you'll be surprised how many of them would love to lease the property, oftentimes furnished. Where where Julie and I live in Puerto Rico in our community and I know you guys aren't going to believe this, but we know people that are paying 60, 70, 80,000. We knew someone who was paying 100,000 a month. A month. A month. That's right. Yeah. And, and happy to be doing it. Yeah. Okay. Because they couldn't find anything else and they're waiting out the market looking for something to buy. Yes, okay? exactly. So you don't know if you don't ask. It's definitely true. And I think of somebody like uh, Federico Salvatore out in LA. One of the nice consequences of having, especially in the luxury, the higher end expensive leases as a leasing listing agent is what that generates for you. Because what, you know, he's got things that are for lease for 12 or 15,000 a month. Okay. Well, what can you get? Think of the leads that come in on that. One of the scripts that he uses is I'm just curious for 15 grand a month. What are you considering also purchasing? Tell me more about why you're leasing. And some of them, maybe 50% of them are interested in buying. Some of them are just transient. They're not going to be there for long and it makes sense for them. Others of them, they're leasing because they can't find anything to buy, which goes back to some of our other podcasts about finding inventory. We've kind of meandered off topic, but you just said something that's really important. You're going to be dealing in a market like this because of the nature of financing with a lot of people that could get financing 24 months ago that can't get financing now. And this is about the whole lender overlay thing. Self-employed people Uh, people that don't have certain credits, all the normal things, but now you have extra things that the lenders are throwing on top. If you live, for example, in certain uh, regions of the country and there's expectations that unemployment's going to rise and you happen to be in one of those industries that maybe the local economies are worried about, you might find that the banks aren't going to be willing to give loans to those types of folks for fear that they're going to lose their jobs. There's all kinds of little micro markets that are starting to evolve around the country. There is no one national real estate market. There is no like homes are going up, homes are going down. You could be living in a, like when Julie and I sold real estate in Columbus, Ohio, we always sold between 100 and 200 homes per year, but we could in any you know single day, we could be selling or listing a house in a market where the average days in the market was going to be six months, eight months, just because, you know, it's competing with a lot of new construction or just the local employers are not, not hiring or maybe even letting people go. And then you go 15 or 20 minutes in another direction in the market. It could not be any different. That's called a normal real estate market. A lot of you have never experienced anything other than everything being essentially like, you know, a crazy hot seller's market. We're going to migrate quickly into a normal market where you're going to start seeing massive amounts of you know, differentiation in the marketplace. You got to really spend the time to get to know the nuanced differences. And again, this goes back to why some agents are becoming incredibly successful in this market while others aren't. The ones that are just saying, I'm going to put you in my CRM and drip on you. Those are the ones that are going to fail. And I don't want to spend a lot of time and bandwidth 
explain to you guys why long-term drip email campaigns don't work. I'll just ask you to ask you know yourselves, how many long-term drip email campaigns or text campaigns or whatever are you uh, susceptible to right now? How many are you actually getting? I get probably dozens of them and I pay attention to none of them. And that's what happens. So the consumer behavior is always going to be what I'm about to describe. When you're interested in buying something, there's a little window like, you know, Julie wanted to buy a new pair of tennis shoes yesterday. Her old tennis shoes were worn out. She's going to be looking for tennis shoes for maybe 15 or 20 minutes. I mean, then, no, then I'm over it. knowing Julie, it's like an hour. But then after that, she's over it. She's on to something else. And she might think about tennis shoes again from a day or now or a day or two from now. But if they haven't um, made the sale, then she's off to something else. Everybody is like that. So you may have put yourself into a drip campaign when you were you know, hot and bothered about buying something or interested in something. Sometimes you even know it. You know, you just exactly. wanted to see the product and they got your email address so that you could get through the front door. And now you're in their drip system. Now, drip campaigns when Julie and I were selling real estate, a lot of real estate back in the 90s, they actually worked because there weren't so many different companies that were doing drip email campaigns or drip any kind of thing. But nowadays, everybody and their brother is doing a drip campaign and people have just learned to tune them out. That's right. And unfortunately, that's the reason, amongst other things, why it's so important that when you, if you really want to be successful in this business, whether you're working with buyers or sellers, you've got to pick up the phone. You've got to have direct communication with them. You must follow a organized approach, AKA a script and ask them pre-qualifying questions to find out really what's going on with them in their lives. You think that being you being too pushy or you have all these psychological mooring lines and why you wouldn't want to do that. But I'm going to tell you the output of that. That consumer is going to be more impressed with you because you did take a professional approach versus all the prior experiences with agents. This is especially true when you're working with more expensive uh, clients because most of their interactions with agents, especially in the last 15 years, have been flibberty jibbity at best. Yeah, and you could get away with that for a while, you know. So I think in conclusion, we'll do five more ways to solve this objection. I would sell, but where am I going to buy? You know, sellers aren't stupid. They're online all the time. They're looking, they're driving around, they're driving through their neighborhoods that they like. They're not seeing a lot of for sale signs that, that work for them potentially. You just can't stop the conversation there. If that's your strategy to just say, well, we'll look at the inventory together and anytime anything pops up, I'll try and get us in the front door. Even if you win at that, there's no guarantee you're going to be competitive. There's no guarantee that they're even going to see it in time to, for it to be active, right? So if that's going to be your strategy, then you've got to lower your expectations for your production this year. Just keeping it real. Yeah, it's true. And in the meantime, what's your homework from this podcast and every podcast? You guessed it. Join Premier mm -hmm. Coaching. It doesn't cost you anything. It's the next natural step. Um, look, the markets, who knows? I heard people being worrisome about interest rates and there's going to be another Fed rate or there's going to be a recession. There's going to be a zombie apocalypse or aliens or all this Mickey Mouse. And uh, that always happens. That's just the news cycle. That's just basically what happens in society. People are addicted to bad news. Yep. But the only way you're not going to make those, that all that bad news and that worrisome stuff, your reality is if you have a proven plan and a path to follow, that's where your confidence is going to come from. That's where your powerful mindset is going to come from. That's the reason that thousands of agents in the last year have joined Premier Coaching because they're looking for a clear direction um, forward. Your easiest path now is to join Premier Coaching. It doesn't cost you anything. The link is in the show description below, along with most of all of our notes. So just scroll down if you're on YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, whatever. Yes, they're all there. Now, if you're on iTunes and you love this podcast, we know tens of thousands of you do because this is the nation's number one listen to daily podcast for real estate professionals. Please do give us a five-star review on iTunes and let the world know why you love this podcast. We certainly and, and sincerely appreciate the five-star reviews. Thank you for your time today. Have a fantastic day. We'll talk with you on the show tomorrow with the next five points. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.